so thank you for joining us again for another RATS webinar. Uh, happy summer solstice, uh, June 21st, or winter solstice, depending on where you are in the world. Um, just want to mention, you know, today was supposed to be our golf tournament, annual golf tournament, but unfortunately due to COVID and the golf tournament's not doing any tournament bookings, we had to cancel again this year, but definitely if you're in the area, catch us next year. We'll, don't see any reason why we won't be doing that. I um, want to mention too that we're going to take a break in August. Uh, just, you know, I think we all need a, a little bit of time off and I think, um, you know, I think people are going to want to need that rest. We'll be back in September for sure. But of course, we are doing July, so uh, register for that. Um, we'll be hopefully going back into person at Polo Social Lounge, and so the time would change for 5 p.m. Uh, we're still planning on recording and publishing on YouTube, and we're undecided about how we're going to do the live broadcast or not. So uh, we'd like to do that. Just logistically, we have to figure that stuff out. Um, welcome to everybody that's joining us from all over. I just want to mention here, this is a long list of countries here, but we have a ton of people from Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, Jordan, India, Oman, Lithuania, Qatar, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, Indonesia, Ghana, Australia, Brazil, Italy, Bangladesh, Philippines, Angola, and of course, Canada and the USA. So this is fantastic. Um, you know, what that means to me, I guess, is that, you know, there's gas turbines are a universally critical asset. and so extremely important um, around the world. And so we definitely wouldn't have the same technologies, quality of life and everything that we have now. Uh, it's still very relevant. You know, I think 1903, Dr. Sanford Moss was the one that wrote a thesis on gas turbines. That was a long time ago and it's still a relevant, relevant technology. And, you know, um, fast forward to today, we're still doing an involvement uh, developments in the technology. We're trying to get to pure hydrogen which is quite interesting. So we'll see what happens, uh, who gets there first. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jared so he can introduce our speaker for today. Hello everyone, Jared Janata here. And uh, as mentioned before, I'm supporting the technical sessions and social media and the things with rats. Uh, also, big welcome to everyone um, across the world, as Andrew said, not just uh, Edmonton, Alberta and Canada anymore. So that's great to see. Um, a good diverse background of rotating equipment expertise and you know kind of seeing the organic growth of it uh, so please continue to share with your networks um, any problems today with the audio visual try to close those extra tabs jump in and out if you have to clear the cache your microphones will be all muted during the presentation but please do use the chat and questions function on the side there to ask your questions and we will make sure there's time to answer those at the end. And worst case, um, we can get that dialogue going on the LinkedIn page or directly with Peter and his team. Um, polls will also be during the presentation. Please do participate in those. Um, it's good interaction and uh, helps Peter uh, direct the uh, direction of the uh, presentation to best fit what you're after. Um, it, this presentation will be recorded, as Andrew mentioned. Um, it's available on our GoToWebinar page, as well as our YouTube page, which we'll be uploading all the presentations to. Um, all of them are, I should say, loaded there, and this one will be uploaded shortly after today's presentation. Um, and as those YouTubers always say, subscribe, like, smash the like button, drop a thumbs up, get it going, whatever you gotta do, um, please do share it. Um, additionally, more informa information on today's uh, presentation by EPT Clean Oil will be um, on the sidebar there where you can download a few of their PDFs. And obviously their company website has a good, a good number of info as well. <clears throat> so if everyone, please do hold on after the presentation. There'll be a quick survey at the end. This does help us um, make things better for future. So please provide those uh, feedback in on the questionnaire there. You Our know, next Jared, sorry, I just realized too that I forgot to update the survey. So if everybody oh. does a survey, if you see something from last month's person, for instance, uh, you know, ignore that. I <laughs> completely forgot to to do that. But you know, there's still obviously still the questions of what can we do, you know, to do better, and what other topics do you want to hear. So, anyways, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Andrew. 
And, and our next RATS uh, technical presentation will be on July 15th. That will be brought to you by Clive Wild and Xavier Gallard from Savia Consulting slash Sulzer. Um, they'll be discussing the role of multi-phase pumps in the latter era of the oil and gas age. So should be good interest there given the latest shift in the major focus on pumping efficiencies and all that good green stuff that we're shooting for here. Um, so stay tuned on the newsletter LinkedIn um, for those upcoming presentations. Any interest for folks to present in the future, get in touch with us, MRO White Papers 2022, uh, future in-person presentations, or you just want more info, get in touch with us. We're happy to engage in and uh, fill those spots with some good info. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest presenter today, Peter Dufresne, Managing Director, COO and VP of EPT Clean Oil based out of Calgary, Alberta. Now, EPT Clean Oil is a product and service provider that helps manage the life cycle and quality specification of turbine and compressor lubricants with forward thinking lubricant conditioning and contamination removal solutions. EPT is committed to transforming operational results using data to drive solutions that remove the root cause and eliminate unpredictable lubricant related failures. EPT provides support to mitigate fail to start unit trips, production losses, and loss generation while improving lubricant performance. Their goal is to ultimately uh, improve um, lubricant and hydraulic control fluid maintenance and reliability in critical power generation, manufacturing, and heavy industrial applications through science, technology, and service. Peter is the COO and co-founder at EPT Clean Oil, where he has worked for the past 27 years. He is a specialist in the area of lubricant maintenance and turbines, control fluids, and other critical applications. Peter is also an author of more than 20 published papers and has presented at many of the industry governing bodies, including EPRI, ASTM, and Can Do Owners Group on the benefits of improved oil maintenance and lab analysis. So with that, I'll pass it over to Peter and thank you again for presenting this interesting talk today. Thanks, Jared, for that. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the, the RATS uh, Society for the invitation today to speak to your group. Uh, it's always a privilege to speak with end users like this and um, try to share a little bit of what we've learned along the way and improve everybody's program. Um, show my screen. I'm not as technical savvy as Andrew here, so just bear with me. Perfect. Okay. All right, take it from here. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, the title of our presentation today is a paradigm shift in gas turbine lubricant maintenance, but it actually extends into other lubricant applications as well, which would include compressors or wherever rust and oxidation inhibited lubricants are used. You know, um, if, if we could have met in 1995 when I was just out of university and you would have told me that I would have spent the last 27 years uh, in this field, I would have told you that that would have been impossible. But this is exactly what's happened and it's a little bit of an interesting story. So I'll just give you a little introduction. Um, in 1995, we started in our garage uh, cleaning dry cleaning fluid uh, from my sister's high school project and uh, ended up at the US Department of Defense a couple years later, uh, cleaning hydraulic fluids on the aircraft carrier fleet. Uh, we did have some pretty incredible technology that my father developed working as a fleet maintenance engineer for a, a very large gas turbine user. Uh, what, what, what we didn't know at the time was that the technology would go worldwide into over 40 countries and save customers close to a billion dollars. Um, I've listed $100 million proven cost savings on the screen because that's what is published as per peer-reviewed journals, but that's really only from one customer. Um, others have saved $10 million in the very first month of operation from a single turbine location. Um, what I want to share with you today is how some of this process was achieved so that you can assess if this is something that could transform results at your company and achieve a similar paradigm shift. 
So our agenda today, uh, we're going to speak quickly about the existing approach to turbine lubricant maintenance to compare and contrast to where we're going. Uh, we have to have a little short introduction of oxidation and varnish. We'll review some tools for the gas turbine and turbo compressor oil maintenance, varnish measurement, impact on fluid formation, fluid treatments, and then ultimately we're going to bring it together to demonstrate the paradigm shift. Uh, ASTM D4378 uh, lists the typical turbine oil as two to five years. Now this document is a little bit dated. So in our experience, we're seeing more like five to eight years life and closer to the eight years life currently, but there is variance in the industry. Um, I had a question on a LinkedIn group this week that you have to change your oil after 10 years. This is completely not the case, okay? So I hope to share with you some information today to shed light on this topic. Uh, but typically, the current life cycle forces uh, an oil change every eight years or so, a flush. Uh, we determine currently that the oil replacement guideline is a combination of low antioxidants, which is less than 25%, combined with a high acid number, okay? Um, existing maintenance, unfortunately, is almost entirely focused on particulate removal. Now, I mean, this is important, obviously, but there's a lot more going on here than particulates. In fact, particulates have nothing to do with the root cause of failure of the lubricant and then quite often the cause of failure of the machine, okay? Um, currently, nothing is being done to manage the oxidation, which is like the cancer in the lubricant, okay? Um, to, to overstate the situation, I'm gonna say that currently we fill, we forget, we dump, we flush, and we repeat. And you know, there's varying degrees of sophistication out there in, in the maintenance that's being done, but that would be the least sophisticated example, okay? But in most cases, we're dealing with a completely unoptimized process that's wasteful and inherently does not manage the risk level that's present. Um, and at the end of the day, this translates to uh, a level of uncertainty on a very high value production asset where there's no business having uncertainty. So there's a lot of room to improve this. Um, yeah. Most gas turbines have very high reliability targets of 97% or even greater. And, and that can sort of hide the problem on a 12 to 24 hour issue per year. But we wanna look at that just a little bit. And, uh, on a frame 70A, which is one of the most common gas turbines used in the world, uh, we're dealing with an 84 megawatt system uh, machine. Um, and at $40 a megawatt, depending where you live, it's quite different. Um, that's, that's producing about $80,000 a day in energy. And if you use this in the oil and gas industry, you also have the steam from the HERSIG, which could generate an additional uh, 10,000 or so dollars per hour. So the production value is up to $368,000 per day with this turbine. The rate of failure relating to varnish varies, of course, um, but what we're seeing is there's one or two incidents per year of about six to 12 hours per incidence for a loss of up to 24 hours per year as an average case. But in some situations, we're seeing much worse, okay? So if you combine that over the 25 year average life for the turbine, that generates uh, a really big number, um, 9.2 million. And you know, I've been laughed out of the room before at a boardroom where they said, you're telling me you can solve a million dollar problem with a $10,000 investment per year? And I said, absolutely. And they say, you stand by that? And I absolutely stand by that. So let's look at updating testing programs. Um, that's really the basic building blocks of everything that we're gonna do moving forward from here. Um, you'd be surprised to learn just how inadequate they are in most cases. Um, I'll, I've got another story for you. Uh, I got a call from a nuclear power plant about 15 years ago that was having an oil issue that forced the plant offline for 30 days. So that was a $30 million failure. In this case, the user had inadequate oil analysis. So I was asking the basics, what is this? What is that? What is this? And they couldn't answer any of these questions. Um, and if you have inadequate oil analysis, it's really impossible to measure the effectiveness of maintenance or what the gaps are. When I told them to change the oil, they said they didn't even have any oil to change it. And it was gonna take two weeks to get that on site. 
Um, this sounds like a crazy story, but they ended up uh, stealing oil and draining the other operating unit down to the minimum operating level to use that amount to dilute and try to improve the quality of the oil they had in the other unit. It reminds me of a TV show I used to watch where the dad worked at a nuclear power plant, but um, um, that's that's kind of my joke for the day. In, a, in other cases, more close to home, I've had call where there's been a plant shutdown costing $80 million in the first week for a completely avoidable issue. And this is in the last five years this happened. And this was an issue where varnish potential wasn't even being tested, but caused the $80 million failure. If your testing program is correct, it'll drive your maintenance program forward so that the failure points can be removed completely from the table. The problem currently is that many users are partially blind and they cannot see what's coming on the horizon. Okay, so the basis to starting or improving your program starts with uh, ASTM. ASTM International, um, which was originally called the American Society for Testing and Materials, uh, is an international group that's open to all interested parties so that they can have a voice at the table in setting the standards. Um, it was started in 1902 and predates all other standard setting bodies in the world. Um, the great thing about ASTM is it provides guidance on what to test and when to test. Uh, ASTM is the global authority for oil analysis methods. Um, it, it really, ASTM provide, and I'm not, I don't get commissioned for ASTM, I'll just say that right now. ASTM provides expert guidance on um, the various lubricants and applications out there. So if you run a gas turbine or steam turbine, there's a standard for that that'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, if you're dealing with a phosphate ester or a fire resistant fluid, the same thing. And then even for auxiliary equipment, these are all available at your fingertips for $40 to $50 and you can download them today, and I would encourage you to do so if you don't already. So the most important question I always get is this one, and uh, ultimately what oil tests are being done is most likely related to what you've been doing in the past rather than what you should be doing, okay? So different companies or labs have standard packages that may or may not be appropriate. What testing is done on a tractor or a diesel engine is obviously very, very different from what you don't wanna do on a turbine, or say an ammonia compressor, but often users start with the basic oil analysis from their lab and don't look at what the ASTM standards are suggesting. So use these standards to tell you what to test, when to test, what the target values are, and what the warning limits are. Um, yeah, and where this is going is I can tell you right now that a $60 test per month is not gonna get you even close to where you need to get to to manage your $25 million machine. Um, and I got that from looking up what the cost of a turbine is right now, and it's $500 to $700 per kilowatt. And um, when you figure out you're spending $60 an oil sample on a $25 million machine, you're going to start to see what's happening here. The next topic I want to address is oxidation of varnish. I've used, I used to have these sections separate, but I put them together because they go hand in hand as cause and effect. I had a renowned chemist once tell me, Peter, oxidation is the source of all evil in lubricants. And I really, that stuck with me. I love that description. But there's a bit of a misconception out there that oxidation only starts to impact the lubricant once the additives are depleted. And this is false. Of course, it gets worse then. But oxidation starts from day one in the oil's life cycle. And it's all around us. All hydrocarbons are oxidizing, including you and me. Uh, hopefully, you took your vitamin C today as these antioxidants will help protect you from the free radicals that are being generated in our bodies. But in the oil application, oxidation produces breakdown products that are dissolved in the oil. So what is varnish? It's really the end result of unmanaged oxidation. Everybody's trying to prevent varnish or buy the perfect oil that's never gonna varnish. But really, if you don't manage your oxidation, you will have varnish one day in your machine. So uh, we're gonna talk a lot today about polarity. Um, what's interesting is lubricants are non-polar while their breakdown products are the inverse, being polar. So there's a natural affinity for, for these to want to separate. So uh, uh, varnish is formed once oxidation products accumulate beyond the point of saturation. They convert from a soluble or dissolved product into an insoluble, also known as a particulate. These deposits are called varnish. 
Uh, an interesting point is that the saturation point or how much ultimately oxidation material can be held in an oil is temperature dependent. So an oil at high temperatures can hold more of this dissolved oxidation material in solution. And as it cools, if it hits a saturation point, the excess spills out of solution and forms a solid deposit. I got a little video here just to show you, to demonstrate what happens. We've taken the same oil here and we've divided it into two beakers and we clean the oil on the right and the oil on the left is original. And what we're doing here is emulating what happens as these oils come down from operating temperature to standby temperature. And what you can see happens is that the, the sample on the left physically looks different now. Um, the, the, the oil is no longer translucent compared to the sample on the right that's the same. And this is demonstrating exactly what happens when your machine shuts down and cools down. That oxidation material is shifting from the dissolved form and into the solid form if it's saturated. So ultimately the goal here is to keep everything unsaturated. Varnish measurement. Uh, membrane patch colorimetry is the ASTM standard is 7843-21. The dash 21 stands for 2021, which is the last time this test was updated. So if you haven't looked at the test method in a while or don't even have it, um, purchase the dash 21 version to see what's different. But essentially it's a derivative of a patch test. A patch test would typically just show us the solids on an oil patch. But because we're using a non-polar solvent, 50 milliliters in this case, that forces everything that's dissolved in that oil into a solid particle. So now we can capture both and measure its intensity on the patch using a photospectrometer. Um, a bright white patch is a sign that there's very little to no varnish in the oil and it has a very unsaturated state and a high capacity to hold material in solution. The inverse case in this shows a dark patch that is near or past saturation with very little or no remaining capacity to hold oxidation material. There's a lot of people that get hung up on these numbers and I wouldn't get hung up on them. It is not like a water level and PPM that you have to be below a certain threshold. Um, I would argue that any stain on the patch, anything other than white on this patch is suggesting to you that your oil is somewhat saturated and oxidation is not being managed. There's some key test points here. Um, the longer the oil is in the sample container, generally the higher the MPC value will be. So the last thing you wanna do is leave these samples on your desk, okay, and then test them. Um, for this reason, ASTM requires that all samples be reset by heating them back to operating condition for 24 hours and then letting them age for 72 hours. This creates a universal interval that all people, all labs in the world can test and measure their varnish to, okay? Um, to show that this has been done, you, ASTM requires that the whole period is reported in hours alongside the NPC result, okay? Uh, what's interesting here is it's not done. If you can't see the whole period on your sample report, it's suggesting to you that the lab is not following the ASTM procedure and that you could be having in, in, inaccurate data in your program. Here's an example of just how important that is. Um, the, in this case, an oil was filtered using a, a fine filter and then MPC was tested immediately without the hold period. What we can see here is it looks like there's no varnish in the oil. But even if we take that same oil and we put it through the same actual, uh, the, the, the varnish test, but done this time to the correct standard, we can see that we get a stain on the patch and we have an MPC value of 22. This inconsistency in how the test is being done out there in the real world is causing a lot of people to chase false positives and then the inverse, not see the real issue. Okay, let's talk about formulation. If you were working as an oil formulator for a large oil company, you, you would essentially have two tools at your disposal to formulate that oil. Uh, you have base oils and you have additives. In the turbine application, we were dealing with oils that are very lightly additized, 98% base oil and 2% additive, something like that, which is very different than your automobile or your truck, which would be 75% base oil and 25% additive. Um, so the additives in the turbine oil are 90% antioxidants and are supposed to react with the oxygen before the oxygen reacts with your base oils. Ideally in this application, you want higher levels of antioxidants as low levels would be an indication or one of the factors where you would change the oil. 
the choice of base oils presents a dilemma between oil stability and base oil polarity. Again, we're talking about this polarity issue that is under the surface here. Um, there's a bunch of oils available with groups one, two, three, four, all hydrocarbon based with higher, uh, the higher groups reflecting uh, more refining, uh, higher level of refining. Uh, group four even are considered synthetic hydrocarbons because the refining level is so high. We also have synthetic based oils that are non-hydrocarbon based shown in the bottom in group five. These would be jet lubes, polyol esters, phosphate esters, and polyalkylene glycols. But now let's go back to that discussion on polarity. Group one are the least highly refined of the hydrocarbon-based lubricants, making them the most polar. Okay, high polarity inherently means that the base oils have more capacity to hold breakdown products. This may get you thinking that this makes them more resistant to varnish, but it's a trade-off that polarity is so good, but the stability is, is not good because they break down very quickly. As you get more, more highly refined base oils like group two or three, you start to see the reverse play out where you get is a very non-polar base oil that can't hold much breakdown material, but it's very stable uh, with respect to oxygen, so it's less prone to form varnish breakdown products. I think we have a, a question right here, a poll. Um, Andrew, yes. if you're able to run that poll on um, what types of gas turbine lubricant you're running, we could run that now. Perfect, okay, so we've got the poll up on the screen now, so uh, it's time to wake up and <laughs> uh, pick uh, pick which ones you use here. Yeah. And I think, it looks like I think it's only selected, so you can only use one. I guess you can really only use one in your turbine, but um, so that's probably fine. I was trying to make these. I find the polling works really well um, in terms of getting the user feedback here. So if you're able to uh, answer the question and then um, we can continue the presentation and come back to what these answers are, okay? Okay, sounds good. I, you know, I just need to, I guess, wait for collection. We're about 60, 65%, so they're kind of steadily rolling in, but... Okay, well, uh, that's just what you just make then. Yeah, um, but perhaps the rest of them don't actually use gas turbines, so maybe that's why we're stopping. So I we'll stop so. there. Um, and so real quickly here, 37% are using group one, group two mineral oils, 50% are using synthetic group three and four, and only 13% have really been adopting PAGs. And you know, that's very consistent with what we're seeing from our side. Okay. And so it's back to your new oil breakdown testing now. Okay. And we've got another one coming up in a couple slides, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was out of sequence there. Yeah, absolutely. So in order to better understand turbine oil breakdown, uh, we've developed a test stand where we can break down oils under high temperatures with a copper catalyst to see how they perform and how long they last. This provides an accelerated breakdown of roughly what you would see over the life um, of a lubricant in service. It's very similar to a toss test or toast test, but we're testing more than just acid. That, that test only measures acid. We want to test everything, including uh, acid number, varnish potential, additive levels, etc. So because we work in this area and we have an extensive research program, over the last five years we've tested every major brand of oil that is commercially available to see how they would break down. On this slide we plotted the results from all major brands showing the MPC varnish potential over time. As you can see, there's a wide range of performances regarding how long it takes for the MPC value to hit a critical level. It's important to point out that many of the product data sheets for these lubricants feature them as being varnish resistance, low varnish formulation, or actually being varnish free. As you can clearly see from the test data, all oils form varnish. When you're looking at the oil specification sheets, consider these as marketing documents. The users are driving this requirement for varnish free, var low varnish or varnish resistant. It's, as we said, varnish is the end result of unmanaged oxidation. So it's really, while there's different qualities and performances in the lubricants, it's really not the oil's issue. It's a maintenance issue, okay? So ideally when selecting an oil for your site, you'd want to do similar testing, but this is just not practical. Um, for most users who are not research companies. So uh, what can we infer or learn from these results? 
Well, we can take a closer look by breaking them down by group. Um, and when we do this, starting with group one, looking at the red line, which is virus potential, we can see that a critical value is achieved at after two hours. Now, I was surprised that we could kill an oil in two hours, but we did. Even more concerning is that the green and the blue lines, which are the antioxidants, um, did not deplete at all. Now, you would have expected that those to deplete, um, but because they didn't, it's suggesting that the base oils are more reactive than the antioxidants. So in this case, it does suggest a formulation issue is present. Um, to look at a more highly refined product like the group two or group three, which are most common, um, we're seeing a much more robust, uh, robust oxidatively stable lubricant that held out for 380 some hours before achieving a critical MPC value. As we showed earlier, all oils will eventually achieve a critical MPC value. It's just a question of how long this takes. Comparing 384 hours to two hours is, is quite a remarkable difference and it's obvious which one you'd want to use. When looking at how the antioxidants stood up, we see a very robust and well-formulated oil with the phenols, which are shown in green, decreasing at a predictable rate while supporting the primary antioxidants that's shown in the blue. What is very interesting here is to see the relationship between the decrease in amine antioxidants and the increase in varnish potential that directly correlate. So to reduce the amount of varnish produced, you want to decrease the rate of amine that you're consuming. The acid number shown in the purple line is at the bottom, and this was surprising because it's completely horizontal and no acid was produced under any circumstance with this base oil, even after the additives were gone, okay? This is showing an extremely good quality base oil. Um, I think some people get a little bit misguided by this MPC and when look at this oil as, as not being a good lubricant, but this is really an outstanding lubricant. Moving to the PAGs just quickly, um, these are being marketed as varnish free. And what we felt, what we found out is that they held out for about 408 hours versus the 384 hours in the previous test. And although it's longer, I was really surprised at the incremental difference between the two considering the price points, which are drastically different. Um, alarmingly, at the end stages of breakdown, at that 400 hour point, once the antioxidants are consumed, this thing takes off and becomes um, even very viscous and sludge-like with the photo you can see there. Um, this is clearly or organic material derived from fluid breakdown, which is the definition of varnish. So to say this is a varnish-free oil is not technically correct. Um, note that the acid number increases after the antiox antioxidants are consumed showing that the base oil for this is not inherently as oxidatively robust as the group two counterpart. Now that we understand what to test, when to test it, and how to predict the end of oil life years ahead of time, and I'll come back to that because we missed a little point there, and how to select an oil, I want to look at treatment and filtration. Peter, uh, do we want to run that poll? Just want to see what people are using. Yeah, let's do that. Sorry about that, um, Andrew. Let's, let's run that question. Um, okay. So how, do you, how, do, you, how do you currently select your lubricant, guys? Yeah. So our, our choices here are supplier relationship and support level you get, or based on product data sheets, um, the cost, or based on actual lab testing. Now we'll, we'll wait for some votes to come in. So we got about half of the attendees so far. Oh, good. Thank you everyone for your participation. I'll shut down the poll in a few seconds. There's a couple more votes just came in. Okay, let's take, take a look here. Uh, share, okay. 37% is based on your vendor or your supplier relationship and the support you get from them. Uh, so you know, you, you got to trust who you're getting your lubricant from. Uh, product data sheets, people, 44% uh, of people, respondents are, are doing it that way. And then 15% are based solely on cost. And 4% are using lab testing to make their decisions. And, you know, I would sort of agree with that assessment. I'd always start with the relationship and the credibility of the company you're dealing with. 
And, um, you know, these companies are some of the biggest companies in the world for a reason. They have huge research departments, teams. They have distribution channels that have been established for dozens of years. So um, who's going to give you the best support is really um, one of my key considerations. Um, absolutely. Um, you got to be careful looking at the spec sheets alone. I mean, you would think as an engineer, you can do that. Uh, it makes sense. But often the values in the spec sheets are below what the oil actually is because they know people are going to get smart on them and test the oils that they get. And if they're not uh, at the specifications on the spec sheet, they're going to reject them and send it back. So oil companies have a safety margin on those spec sheets. So you can't use them as your baselines. You actually need to actually test your real lubricant to get the proper baselines for tweaking your oil analysis and getting it more sophisticated. Um, and I guess I missed that point, so we should probably talk about that. So currently, if you're losing 10% um, of your primary antioxidant per year, you could probably predict about a 10-year life in your lubricant, right? So this is how nuclear power plants do it. They can only change the oil every 18 months. They're planning out 30, 36 months ahead of time. So if you're five years um, in the life cycle of the oil and have depleted 50% of your additives, you know that per year you're depleting 10% and you're not going to get to that level that you need to for that 36 month uh, change out requirement. So um, I like taking the data that you have, putting in a spreadsheet, calculating your consumption rate of additive each year so that you can see how things are working and actually see the horizon years ahead of time to, to, to get a flavor for what's happening in that system. You ultimately want to align the maintenance window on that turbine with the life cycle of that oil, right? Um, this is more complicated in LNG facilities where you have your equipment in series. One machine might deplete at 20% per year while the other might be depleting at 10%. Well, obviously we have one maintenance window on that, uh, on, that, on, on, that on that production facility. So um, increasing your um, top up rate on the one lubricant uh, would, would be one way to improve uh, and match those together. Okay, so just moving to varnish removal here, if you can prevent oil saturation, you can prevent varnishing, okay? So understanding how saturated your oils are um, and managing the, the breakdown um, in those oils, um, you can, can actually make big strides forward. So um, your maintenance ultimately should be removing that material, preventing saturation, so that this oil is gonna be, have the same performance criteria under all pressure, temperatures, and flow conditions in your system, okay? So removing varnish is, um, varnish is a reversible process because contamination is simply changing from a solid to a dissolved. So if we remove it as a, as a dissolved, any solid generated from that lubricant will be forced back into solution via chemical equilibrium. And we've got a kind of cool video to show how that's done. From the moment lubricants are put into service, they chemically break down. Oh, jeez. The primary pathway, oxygen. Sorry, it's pausing. I don't want to pause this. Oxidation. Over time, the chemical breakdown products accumulate, saturating the lubricant with unwanted contamination, initiating lubricant failure. Then manage the formation of insoluble particles, deposits, and varnish are inevitable. This contamination, chemically attracted to mechanical surfaces, results in mechanical failures and costly production losses. For too long, this has been the status quo. It's time to manage the unmanaged. Meet SVR, a chemistry solution for a chemistry problem. Patented ion exchange resin technology, ICB, SVR manages chemical breakdown in the lubricant 100% of the time, stopping the contamination cycle in its tracks. More than physical filtration, ICB removes chemical breakdown problems with varnish at the molecular level, cleaning the lubricant every time it cycles through the kidney blue circuit. The result, insoluble chemical breakdown products dissolve back into the lubricant, becoming soluble. 
artificial gases through the ICD, remove the soluble partition, desaturating and restoring the lubricant to the condition it was at the date of install. Transform lubricant swelling work and manage unmanaged chemical breakdown with SVR and ICD. Restore MPC varnish potential to new condition. Manage the chemistry properties of lubricants, including acid number. Deposits from bearings and other mechanical surfaces. Let's get us to the next slide. Hopefully you heard the sound on that. It was a little bit quiet, but uh, it wasn't too, too bad. A little bit choppy. These videos are on YouTube and on our website. You can turn your speakers up and listen to them on your own. <laughs> yeah, your children will really go, what is going on now? Um, but the ICB ion exchange technology is the exact opposite of a particulate filter, which is really the focus of most programs now and the weakness. By using resin-based technology, we can get to the heart of the matter and remove the dissolved contamination before it can ever cause issues. You can look at ICB as being polar, sacrificial surface area that gets in between the oxidation in your system and the mechanical surfaces. It's really like a bulletproof vest for your, for your machine because varnish would always go to the ICB first before it would ever go on the metal surface, okay? Um, but moving beyond varnish, what we've learned by removing the oxidation material as it's generated, there's very other, there's many other important considerations, including longevity, additive consumption, and ultimately the life of the oil. Because we have these uh, amazing research department, they they have uh, recreated the oil breakdown tests with and without the ICB, and you would never really want your oil filtration system run at these temperatures, but when we do, we see extraordinary things. And we can see that after 53 days or um, 1,200 hours or so, if my math is correct, uh, we still have a lubricant that looks to be in new condition from an appearance perspective and from the varnish potential test method, we see no result. So basically a nil. So this is fantastic that it can, uh, this is even possible at the end of the breakdown test, okay? So we have a poll question coming up um, here, but in a real life case study, we have the cleanup phase and the stability phase. So you can see as we bring down the MPC levels, there's a little bit bouncing around and eventually we come down to what we call the fluid stability phase. When you're operating in the fluid stability phase, your oil additive consumption values will be minimized, okay? So the question is how do we get you to here as soon as possible so that we can have the biggest effect on your life cycle? Some users look at, the end result here and going, well, this is a perfect time to remove the varnish removal system. However, this is quite the contrary to that. As soon as we remove it, you're gonna put the oil back into an unmanaged condition where you're not managing oxidation. So our, we really strongly advocate and 90% of our users or even more always elect for permanent installation and permanent conditioning. So in terms of who is using a varnish removal system right now, um, why don't we just pull the pull the audience right now, Andrew, to see what the case is there? Sure, sounds good. So the poll is active. If you're using varnish removal, when did you install it? Following a failed lab result, following an on-site failure, or with a new charge of oil? And this will be our last poll question, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer period after. Okay, it looks like um, bolts are slow to come in, so maybe a lot of people haven't used a varnish removal. Yeah, we do see that. Um, we're seeing about uh, a third of users have permanent installation and another third are um, rotating equipment. And then there's a third that aren't really doing anything. So at a more vulnerable state, that's what we normally see. I'm not, what did the polls come in at? Okay, well, I guess we could have added a fourth uh, option of we don't we don't use varnish removal. But in any case, uh, of the people that did, 50% following a failed lab test, 17% following an on-site failure, and 33% uh, with a new charge of oil. Oh, interesting. Well, again, um, we all too often get the call, 
in the 11th hour uh, refineries at a critical level they need to fly equipment out it's so much easier to maintain oil quality in pristine condition than it is to resurrect one or or or, or bring something back from a severely degraded situation so the sooner you can get in this life cycle of the oil the more dramatic effect you can have on the cost savings um, uh, just a picture here before and after this one's from a Siemens gas turbine um, so in terms of long-term oil management here and I'm rushing a little bit based on time um, was, um, but you got to view the lubricant more as an asset and less as a consumable it has the potential to last for the life of the equipment, not necessarily going to last for the life of the equipment, but we have to strive to achieve that benchmark. Um, right now, fluid replacement is based on a combination of low additives and high acid number. So let's put um, systems in place to manage those two values. And then, you know, if we get double of our life, that's a significant step forward. If we get triple, that's an extraordinary result. Um, so use uh, an ICB conditioning system or an ion exchange resin conditioning system to remove the oxidation material to manage it and because there's no oxidation material left in the oil the effectiveness of lubricant top-up is actually uh, maximized currently when you put lubricant top-up in your system the additive component of that would normally be wasted very quickly but when there's nothing for that uh, new oil or additive to react with you can preserve it So here's a case study from a base load gas turbine in Alberta uh, after nine years where the, the conditioning system was installed on day one. And what you can see here is we've had perfect oil quality for the nine year period. MPC values have never been over 1.8. Acid number is still lower than new level, okay? So if you go by the criteria when to change the soil, which is a combination of low additive and um, high acid number, we, we, we're still looking good on the acid side, but how does the additive side look? What we see is that 92% of the primary antioxidant remains, okay? So there's 92% remaining life in this oil after 10 years of baseload operation. This is the paradigm shift. If you can get your oil maintenance programs to this level, extraordinary things happen both on the performance of the equipment, the performance of the lubricant, and the impact on reliability of your operation. Uh, we have some ROI calculations here. I'm not going to go through them in detail because you have the presentation and they're on the website as well. But basically, currently, if you change your oil every eight years, which is a bit optimistic, um, and you change it three times, you're looking at almost a million dollars in this application on oil lifetime uh, oil costs compared to what could be uh, $386,000. You obviously have to deduct the cost of uh, treatment and conditioning systems, which would come in at $155,000, which generates an ROI of almost 300%. So I don't know about you, but a 300% ROI should get the bosses uh, cooperating with you. Um, when you start factoring in production losses, which are going to be highly variable, but even if I take uh, one day a year, one day a year over 25 years is going to generate um, a cost savings of 4.5 million, which is a return on investment of almost 3,000%. So in summary of today's presentation, the paradigm shift is treat your fluids like an asset, not a consumable, manage the oxidation that's 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 uh, occurring in these systems so it doesn't come in and in, in sneak up on you and bite you, um, but understand and use the tools at your disposal to manage this. Um, it starts with oil analysis. I hope everybody gets off this presentation and they start looking at their oil analysis and buy that ASTM procedure and start assessing gaps, opportunities. Um, use high quality oil from a manufacturer you trust and from a supplier that gives you excellent support. Ultimately, those are your go-to people. Um, use a conditioning system to manage oxidation levels. Um, clean your oil so it can clean your system. And you've dem we've demonstrated from the return on investment that it's a very prudent investment. Um, but the other side to it that you can't quantify is the value of the predictability that this provides. Um, all companies like predictable costs and predictable outputs. Um, by putting an active managing system to manage oxidation in your system, you can achieve both. So with that, I'd like to thank you and turn it over to any questions that you may have. Awesome, thank you, Peter. That was uh, really good. Uh, let me just see here. So we have a question. I was gonna move some stuff off my screen so I can see it. 
so for oil testing uh, in a combined compressor lube oil system, uh, is there a best area in which to take the oil sample from? Uh, you know, does it matter if it's from the bottom or uh, from the line that's feeding the console? Um, what's your opinion? There's gonna be different answers to this question, but generally a couple things. You always wanna take the sample from before any filtration, okay? If you take a sample after filtration, it's not of meaningful value, okay? You can do that too to assess the quality of filtration, but don't do that. Typically you'd want a, a dynamic sample from the operating system uh, before any filters. And um, the most important thing is when selecting that sample is that it's dynamic and that you are purging the line. If it's um, a liter you need to purge or three liters you need to purge to get that sample, um, that's very important. Um, the other thing is you need to um, rinse your sample, you need to rinse your sample bottle out uh, at least two times. Some people do three times just to get rid of any residual contamination that's in that bottle, okay? Yep. Yep. We have a, another question here um, for Peter. Is there any particular ISO 4406 code prior to mounting a varnish removal skid? Not normally. Um, in the extreme case, when you get to the 20s, um, you got bigger problems, right, than varnish. But when you get into the 20s, you can prematurely foul your varnish removal filters, whether they're cellulose based or whether they're ion exchange resin based. So um, there isn't. Um, we used to actually force everybody to pre-treat their oil with uh, high efficiency filters before we installed the varnish removal filters. But what we found is that there was really an incremental benefit achieved in that. So it's, it's easier not to do that. Um, um, our systems have both varnish removal, dissolved contaminant removal, acid removal, but they also have that uh, high efficiency post filter as a polishing filter on the back end. So you accomplish both uh, anyways. And looks like we have a couple more here. Um, so we've got another one. What is the function of alpha level oil separator for lube oil purification? Was there a word after alpha? Uh, just alpha level oil separator. Okay. What so alpha function? Laval is a company name that makes centrifuges, okay? Um, then they became Bowser units and they, they turned into a couple different companies. This is legacy equipment in most cases that was installed 50, designed 50 years ago um, and it's a centrifuge. And we use the centrifuge to either remove free water or um, large particles. Most, in, in most plants, I would say 90% of that equipment has been replaced with um, current technology. They're very hard to service those units. Very good. Uh, that's that's everything we see so far. So if you know, for the people that are still on the line, if you have questions, feel free to uh, ask them. Uh, I just yeah, want I got, to make, yeah, go ahead, Jared. Oh, I was just going to say I got a couple more here. Um, I was going to say what uh, what in your opinion, Peter? What's the most common misconception that you hear about turbine oil maintenance? That uh, oxidation starts after the antioxidants are consumed. It's only at that point where uh, we need to implement corrective actions. But really, by ASTM standards, by the time the antioxidants are consumed, you're already 25% past the oil replacement interval, right? So that's way, way, way too far down the food chain. So no, you need to take take a look at this from day one. Okay, and and I was also gonna say, you know, this obviously uh, you're focused on the uh, turbine applications. Obviously varnish removal is important for all types of large sump systems, compressors, pumps. Um, would you say there's, you know, a rough cutoff for how large a sump would be for the economics to work? for incorporating such a uh, varnish removal system? Well, you know, normally it's not, it's a really good point you make. Um, some size you would think would be the driving factor, but it's more the production value, right? If, if uh, you have a control system on 1100 megawatt uh, turbine, that's 800 gallons, um, that's the most critical um, reservoir in the entire plant. 
So the volume of it's sort of irrelevant. You just have to put a system on there. Then you get to the lube oil. There's other really super critical places where you absolutely have to have uh, this system. Um, but generally speaking, if you get out of power gen in, in oil and gas facilities and you get into more general industrial applications, we're going to look at a combination of production value, uh, oil value, um, um, etc. It, it can I, it, it can be different depending on what the drivers are in that situation. Um, steel plants, for example, would usually have lower ROIs on adding conditioning systems because they change the oil so frequently. But you'd be surprised actually if we can take an oil life from one year to two year, it has very significant return on investments. And what we're seeing um, is normally you can double or triple. Um, life in that case with some very easy and straightforward steps. Right, so there's a few factors that you got to look at for each kind of specific application um, and you know, what's it worth to the facility. <laughs> you know, whether I'm looking at a gearbox, a hydraulic system or a compressor, I'm always trying to start with what is the driving factor to failure here? Is it water? Is it heat? Is it uh, is it the machine chewing up the oil or is the oil in the machine, right? You, you sort of, is it a chemistry issue or is it engineering issue? These are all factors that sort of come into play here because there's always low hanging fruit. And then there's much more complicated issues where uh, you have a combination of both chemistry and engineering issues going on. Gotcha. All right, we've got two minutes left, but we do have a, a couple of three other questions um, to go through. So. Uh, the first one here is, you know, what happens if you run a varnish removal skid uh, with a choked post filter? You get no flow. Yeah, you got to clean out that filter, really. Yeah. So and normally that's telling me something else because quite often, um, if you have sufficient varnish removal in the primary stage, the post filter is really there for polishing, and it would be very seldom for that to have to choke. So that kind of leads into the next question here for you, Peter. You know, what is the general maintenance requirement on these um, varnish removal skids? And I guess the second part is how often, you know, can you expect to change the filter elements? Obviously, that's going to be based on, you know, what the rating is of it. But um, can you estimate a typical filter element uh, cost life cycle range, you know, if you're looking at the full picture? Well, there's kind of a fork in the road. Technology platform one is particulate removal devices that generally wait for varnish to form and then they kick into high gear and remove all the material. And then there's those that are resin based that are preventative in scope and prevent varnish from happening in the first place. The sooner you can get in the oil life cycle, the lower the cost will be. It's obviously much cheaper to maintain an oil than it is to recover an oil. So normal in the normal baseline case, using resin-based technology, you would change the filter after three months, and then you'd be on an annual cycle thereafter. And I can't really speak to the particulate removal um, systems because they're waiting for varnish to be created before they work. So that's going to be based on a whole bunch of other criteria. You bet. Yeah. Well, we've got one minute left. We're going to try and get to one more question. I think we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but maybe we'll try to answer them uh, you know on, on LinkedIn sure so now this last one here uh, what, what's the general maintenance requirements on these conditioning skids and you know how often do you expect to you need to oh, change just did that one oh and yeah we, that okay sorry and yeah so I guess the is ICB effective to water glycol uh, hydraulic fluids um, it depends. It depends what we're trying to accomplish, right? Um, what I'm finding on the glycol fluids is that people let them get way too far down um, the life cycle and they really have to be dumped and flushed. Um, if you can start managing earlier on in the situation, um, you can maintain the values. But in some of those, recovery can be very, very um, uh, not cost effective if you start too late in the process. Okay, very good. So, uh, yeah, that's all the time we've got for today. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. That was awesome. So, uh, for, you know, anyways, you know, go ahead. You're about to say something. 
<laughs> no, I just want to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. And if we didn't get to your question, please just send it, circulate it, and we'll make sure that it gets answered. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so it will be on our YouTube channel uh, following this. And um, yeah, feel free, feel free to engage us more on LinkedIn. We can continue the conversation on this. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in July. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.